I thought um, for our text that I would read the fourth commandment again, and maybe also the passage, the couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 4, just to kind of get back into the queue, the the ideas surrounding this. And let me just remind you, too, that everything that we've seen thus far is really uh, implied in... I, I, well, in, in just the first few words of the commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, keeping the day holy means setting it apart to God. And to set it apart to God means that we need to separate it from other things so that we can spend the day with Him. So remember what holiness means. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Well, creation week is another interesting topic. But let me, um, let me just uh, move over to Hebrews 4 and, and read Uh, Again, remembering that we just read about the commemoration of the original creation based upon God's work week and His day of rest. Remember, in the New Covenant, the day of rest commemorates a new creation that was brought about by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what um, I believe, and not just me, but many commentators believe, is in, in the author to the Hebrews' mind as he writes this. So there remains a Sabbath rest, and remember the word there means a, sab- a day of, of rest, a Sabbath keeping like that that the Jews kept for the people of God because the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. And again, speaking about the completed work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I thought what we could do to begin was, again, just briefly review some of the things that we have seen. So I'm going to try to summarize this in just a couple of minutes. We've seen how the Sabbath has really been a part of God's design from the very beginning. He established it at the end of His creation week, really the day after He created man. So it was something that man had to enjoy from the very beginning. We saw how it continued from the time of Adam until Moses when it was incorporated into the Ten Commandments, written on stone to show us its permanence. We saw that Isaiah, or the Lord through Isaiah, told us that it would continue into the New Covenant. As a matter of fact, we read that passage again uh, this morning. We saw how Jesus kept it and how He taught His disciples to keep it, how He predicted that they would keep it in the future after He had died and was buried and had risen again and ascended into heaven. And he commanded them to teach that, you know, what he had taught them regarding the Sabbath to all the nations, that they might do the same. Uh, We saw from this passage that I just read how Jesus' redemptive work didn't do away with the Sabbath, but established it on a new day that commemorates his work of the new creation, and how this change of day is still in keeping with the language of the commandment itself. Remember, it gives us the frequency work six days and rest on the seventh, and it gives us the duration, keep the day holy, but it doesn't give us a specific day. That's something that has to be given to us from outside the commandment, originally, again, the old creation, but now in the new covenant based upon the work of Christ. Now, we've also seen that on this day, there are certain things that we need to set aside. Our work, okay, except for that that's related to the gospel, work that's absolutely necessary, and works of mercy. And we also saw that we need to be careful not to make others work. Uh, We also need to set aside our recreations. This morning we were looking at what the Lord said through Isaiah the prophet, um, uh, not only about how to keep the Sabbath holy, but also the blessing we could expect for so doing. He said that if we would not tread on the Sabbath, basically not walk all over it, by doing what we want rather than what He wants. If we would delight in this day, that is, if we would look forward to it and, and want to keep it, 
and if we would actually keep it as he calls us to do it by putting away our work and our recreations and, again, thoughts and words. Specifically, those things that are tied to this world, the things that draw our hearts away from God, um, you know, those that draw us, again, with regard to recreations, those that draw us towards him being the exception. If we wouldn't think about them so that our minds are drawn away, if we wouldn't speak about them so that we actually draw the thoughts of others away from him, he said not only would this show that we really do love him and take delight in him, but he said he would bless us by giving us the spiritual strength we need to overcome our enemies through the one he has sent into the world, the Lord Jesus. Now, he said this was his promise to us, and the Lord never breaks his promises. He gave us this day to separate us from the world so that we can reorient our lives and focus them on him so that we would be reminded of what life is really all about, what the goal of life is. It isn't to, you know, amass riches and, and basically enjoy the world as much as we possibly can, but rather it's meant to store up riches in heaven and prepare for that eternal Sabbath that we are going to enter into through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of our days, which is heaven. Now, that, that's my summary or my recap. Uh, tonight, I want us to consider one final point, um, and it's this, that since the Lord has made this day holy, since He has set it apart as the day that we are to remember uh, what He has done for us through His Son, Jesus, since we are to spend it entirely with Him, let's make sure that we do keep it holy. Okay, so some closing exhortations. First of all, by remembering to keep the day. Okay, we have to remember. That's what the commandment's all about. Remember, don't forget. Now, we've already seen that it's one thing to say that this day is a delight. It's another actually to delight in it. It's one thing to call it honorable. It's still another to honor it. Now, everything that we've heard so far, if we just let it kind of pass through and not retain it, it's not going to do us any good unless we actually hold on to what we've heard. And we're not going to receive the blessings that God has promised, the greater assurance that we really do love Him, or this spiritual strength that will allow us to overcome our enemies unless we actually keep the day and spend it with God. Okay? So the first thing is, let's remember to keep it. But secondly, and here's where we're going to break a little new ground, uh, let's keep it holy by not making other days equal to or greater than this day. Okay, now again, I told you I was going to step on some more toes, touch some sensitive areas. Maybe this is a sensitive area for some of us, but it's something we need to think about. Now, if I were to ask you, okay, which day of the entire year is most important to you? Okay, what comes to mind? What would you say? Your birthday, okay, your anniversary, Maybe the day you met your significant other, the day you graduated, maybe from high school, college, or vocational school. Would you say it was the day that the Lord saved you, okay? Or would you say Christmas, I like Christmas, that's the best day of the year, or maybe it's, it's Easter. Now, all of these days are important days, okay? We don't want to depreciate that. They're important days because they do mark important events, some of them in our lives, and some of them for our lives, the birth of Christ, his, his resurrection, those are all very important. And there's certainly nothing wrong with remembering these things. As a matter of fact, it's, it's really a part of our tradition, isn't it, to mark significant events in, in our lives. As a matter of fact, that was something God was doing, as we know, even in the Old Testament, whenever he did something special something for his people, something related to his plan of salvation. He wanted his people to remember those things, and so he gave them memorials to do so. He gave them the Feast of Passover to remind them of how he redeemed them out of Egypt, how through the sacrifice of a lamb and the placing of its blood on the doorposts and the lintels of their homes, the angel of death would pass over them and spare their firstborn, while he destroyed the firstborn out of Egypt, he brought them out of there by an outstretched hand, by a mighty arm. 
He wanted them to remember that, uh, not to mention the fact, of course, it's a picture of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose blood causes the angel of death to pass over us. But he also gave them the Feast of Booths. He wanted them to remember that they wandered in the wilderness for many years and lived in tents until he brought them into their own land. They established a memorial for themselves with the Feast of, of Purim, remember, where um, Haman uh, wanted to destroy the Jews and had made plans to do that, but God spared them um, through Queen Esther's uh, intervention. So they celebrated that once a year to remember God actually gave them this deliverance. God commanded Joshua to take 12 stones from the Jordan after he had Basically, the Lord had parted the Jordan and made the, the waters stand on either side as all Israel passes through into the promised land. They took 12 smooth stones from the, uh, from the middle of the, the river and they set them up as a monument so that in the years to come when their children would ask, what do these stones mean? They would be able to tell them, the Lord brought us into our land supernaturally and he gave us uh, this land. Now, there are many, many more things in the Old Testament that God gave to his people uh, as memorials because he wanted them to remember what it is he had done for them. But in the New Covenant, he hasn't really given us very many. Actually, he's only given us two. Only two things to remind us of how he fulfilled all of these things uh, through his son, the Lord Jesus. And both of them are marked by that special adjective I was telling you about, that the Lord's, the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Day. Now, the first is the Lord's Supper. Remember, Jesus told his disciples when he broke the bread and gave them a cup, do this in remembrance of me. So here's one memorial that God does not want us to forget. He wants us to remember how much he loved us and how he laid down his life in order to save us. Every time we celebrate that table, and we do that every week because we believe the early church actually did that every week. That table reminds us of everything that Jesus has done in order to bring us to heaven. Now, the second memorial is the Lord's Day, okay? Uh, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. In the Old Covenant, that was true. In the New Covenant, it is equally true. Only in this case, the Christian Sabbath is the Lord's Day. Uh, this day, he wants us to remember the completion of his work. I mean, what is the point of the Lord's day? It's the day when Jesus entered into his rest by rising from the dead. And we know, as we're reminded on this day, because Jesus rose from the dead, that we also will rise with him. I mean, our bodies will rise uh, from the grave, and that our souls will be with the Lord in heaven in the interim because we have trusted Jesus, because we are following him, because we are listening to what he has to say and we're doing uh, those things. Now, again, if I were to ask which day of the year should be the most important to us as we're thinking about days, what should we say? Well, how about the day that God actually sets apart as the one day that we are to remember each year, and that is the Lord's Day. Now, let me say again. It's not that his birth is not important, Christmas, you know, we think of it at Christmas, even though Jesus was not born on, at that time of the year, okay? We, we know that fairly certainly. And it's not that the resurrection isn't important, Easter, certainly it's important. It's that the Lord sees these things, as well as everything that Jesus did, as being so important that he wants us to celebrate them every week on the Lord's Day, and not just once a year, okay? doesn't want us to break it apart and celebrate this at a certain time of the year and this at another time of the year, but celebrate all of it every single week on the Lord's Day. Now, you know, this, this is actually the way that the Lord's Day used to be viewed um, in basically our circles, and we would say probably in, you know, the circles of the church in general, um, this was the most important day for the Reformed Church, let me put it that way. Samuel Rutherford, who some of you remember, uh, was that great 17th century Scottish Presbyterian and theologian. Okay, um, very practical guy, by the way. His uh, letters 
are, are considered a classic, the letters of Samuel Rutherford. But he wrote a lot of other things. But he won't, once wrote this to his congregation in his letters. He says, remember that I forewarned you to refrain from the dishonoring of the Lord's blessed name in swearing, blaspheming, cursing, and profaning of the Lord's Sabbath, willing you to give that day from morning to night to praying, praising, hearing of the word, conferring, I think he means by that talking, you know, to Christian brothers and sisters, and speaking not your own words, but God's words, thinking and meditating on God's nature, word, and work, and that every day at morning and at night, at least, you should sanctify the Lord by praying in your houses publicly in the hearing of all, and that no day besides the Sabbath, which is of his own appointment, should be kept holy and sanctified with preaching and public worship of God for the memory of Christ's birth, death, resurrection, and ascension, seeing such days so observed are unlawful, will worship, and not warranted by Christ's word, and that everything in God's worship not warranted by Christ's testament and word was unlawful. I want you to see he takes that very seriously, right? What he's saying is that God has given us a day, and we need to use that day and take, sanctify that day by doing, remembering the things we ought to be remembering and doing the things we ought to be doing. And when we begin to multiply these events throughout the calendar year, we're actually doing something God never really intended for us to do. And again, no matter how full the church calendar gets, and we don't have a church calendar here, but I think you understand there are churches that do, it still is not... It's, well, it's still not going to be more than remembering everything that Jesus has done every Lord's Day, which is what He wants us actually to do. So, this is the superior way of doing it. This is the way God has called us to do it, and that's the way we need to do it. When we separate these events and we create other days to commemorate them, okay, or assign maybe particular Lord's Days, because, you know, usually, well, Christmas doesn't always fall on the Lord's Day, but... Easter, I believe, does, okay? It elevates that particular Lord's Day above all the rest, okay? And, of course, above the weekly observance of the Lord's Day. And if we do that, it really takes away from the special character that God has given this day. Now, let me, let me also say that I don't think it's wrong for us to take advantage of the Christmas season. We've, we've done that before, right? Or the Easter season, by uh, using it to share Christ with others, go out caroling, um, have special services where you know, we might focus on those particular events, the birth of Christ and, and uh, the resurrection of Christ, but we don't stop there. We realize that there are people who venture out to churches on those two days that may not venture out to church the rest of the year, and we want them to hear the gospel. We also have opportunities with family members and friends that I think is perfectly legitimate to do that. But again, we need to be careful that we don't see these days as somehow more special than the weekly Sabbath or uh, the Lord's Day. So again, uh, these are important events, but let's not, again, um, depreciate the Lord's Day by elevating one or by making other days Christmas falls on, let's say, Wednesday, having all these special services to commemorate that. That's not what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to do it on the Lord's Day, every Lord's Day. Now, here's, we're, we're going to dive a little bit deeper here and maybe step on toes a little bit harder. Uh, another way that we can take away from this day is by adding other events to this day that really have nothing to do with, with the Lord. Now, remember, the Lord's Day has been all but lost in, in this culture, and it's not uncommon to see this day being used for many other things. Uh, again, last, we noted this morning and last week, you know, that the Super Bowl took place on, on Sunday. Um, 
I mentioned as well the, the, the Summer Olympics, but you know, the Winter Olympics, which are ongoing right now, they also carry on through the Lord's Day. And these events are televised, and they can become a temptation to watch. And, you know, it, it's sad that uh, our culture is willing to, and I'm thinking here of even professing Christians, give up the Lord's Day in order to watch the Super Bowl, or as some churches do, as I said before, drop the big screen, watch, the, watch it as a congregation, as an event the congregation takes a part of, and, and to, uh, what do you call it, cancel the worship service so that we can watch that. So it, it's just sad that this happens in our culture, but it's even sadder when those who profess to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ do that. Now, we need to be careful that, that we don't, obviously. And again, I, I think one of the most encouraging examples we have of this is somebody I brought up this morning. Actually, didn't intend to do that. It was probably in my mind because it was in the evening. But Eric Little, and you're familiar with the movie Chariots of Fire? Have you seen that? If you haven't, you've got to watch that movie. Okay, it was a secular movie, but it was about the history of two men who ran in the Olympics, and Eric Little was one of them. And what was unique about Eric Little, and seemed to be practically, uh, he was practically the only person, I think maybe the only person who actually did this, or maybe whoever did this, I don't know. But he was a runner in the Olympics, and when it came time, we found out that one of his heats was to be run on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day. He refused to do it, even though uh, a prince was leaning on him, his country was looking to him to win gold medals for their honor and so forth. There was a great deal of pressure. But he knew that he could not compete in that sport and honor the Lord at the same time and worship God at the same time. He also knew you couldn't go to that event. I mean, he wasn't even there to support his other teammates who were running on the Sabbath. And I imagine that also would have put some pressure on him because he wanted to worship the Lord. He spent the day worshiping the Lord. He spent the day preaching. He was a minister, okay? And worshiping. By the way, it's the same Eric Little that went to China and died in China, sharing Christ with others. He had the opportunity to go home, but he let other people take his place, and as a result, he stayed there so long that his health broke and, and he died. But this was his commitment to the Lord, and that's the kind of commitment the Lord wants us to have. He spent the day resting and worshiping because he wanted to honor his Lord, and we know the Lord honored him gave him a great deal of um, publicity by winning all these races. And every time he would win a race, as he's working up towards the Olympics, as they're giving him this honor and medal and interviewing him, he would preach the gospel to those who were there. Now, <clears throat> there are still more things, and maybe this is where we, again, might feel a little bit of pain. Uh, there are other events that also find their way onto this day, okay? Okay such as Mother's Day. I mean, what, is, what day does Mother's Day usually fall on? It's always Sunday, isn't it? Seems like it is. Father's Day, birthdays sometimes, anniversaries. They, they do fall on the Lord's Day from time to time. Now, let me say, there's certainly nothing wrong with thanking God for the blessings that He has given to us of mothers and fathers, of giving us Life, if our birthday happens to be on this day, or marriage, if our anniversary is on this day, we should thank God that He has given these things to us. They're great blessings and gifts. But we do need to think about whether this is the day on which we should celebrate those events, or whether we should move those celebrations either the day before, the day after, or some other day, so that we can give the day to Him. Now, I remember... Um, I don't think I probably said this for quite some time, but I do remember the first time I said this uh, to the congregation that was here years ago, and it really incensed them. You know, and the question is, should it? Should it incense us? If this day belongs to the Lord, shouldn't we give it to Him? We can thank Him for these things, but should we celebrate? Should we make ourselves the focus when the Lord should really get that focus? Well, again, we need to think about these things. Think about them as the Bereans did, remember, that Paul was preaching to. He, they examined the Scriptures daily to see whether what he was telling them was the actual truth or not. And if they saw that it was, they embraced it. 
as God's Word. If, if we see that this really is what the Lord desires for us to do on this day, then that's what we need also to commit ourselves uh, to do. Now, in closing, let me just remind us again that whatever the Lord says, whatever He calls us to do, is always for our good. And we may not necessarily see it right away. We know that when we're young Christians, we, we don't understand uh, a lot of the things that we hear. But as we get some experience under our belts, we begin to see it. And if the Sabbath is a new concept to us, uh, the same thing can happen. But again, know that God always has a good purpose behind everything that He says. So I hope that through this series, we begin to see what that good purpose is, that God really intends a blessing, and <clears throat> how great a blessing this day really is, uh, because, again, it's a day that He has given to us every single week to spend with Him and to spend with one another in the things that we enjoy the most. So may He grant not only that we would delight in this day, but that we would also honor this day by spending it with Him. Not only that we would have a stronger assurance that we really do love Him and we belong to Him, but also a stronger love with which to serve Him um, throughout the week. Uh, that is God's purpose, and it's a good one. Well, let's, let's um, bow in just a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us see that and, and to apply this.